Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 64 of the Alabama Liberal Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about the recession. Has it already started? Absolutely. Is there anything that the Trump administration can do about it? Probably not. Is there anything that you can do about it? Absolutely. And I'm going to give you some investment tips and how to prepare, how to get ready for it, and maybe some deals out there that you may not be familiar with, what not to put your money in, what not to do with your money at a time like this. But first, let's just do a quick recap because this is the first time that I've ever done five episodes in one week, one episode per day. And I'll probably take next week off and you may not see me for a week or so because five episodes probably give you a chance to catch up. But let's look back at what the week has been. Monday, we had taken back the Senate, which was a great episode, broke down each individual Senate race what to expect, who's running, the odds of flipping it, things like that. And then that kind of dovetails nicely into yesterday's episode, which was 63, an interview with Mike Breuer, one of the more interesting Senate candidates. He's running against Mitch McConnell for the Kentucky Senate seats. You know, sometimes people say Trump is not the disease, he's a symptom. And certainly Mitch McConnell was there for decades before Trump ever thought to run for politics. That was really interesting because sometimes Trump up so much energy, we may forget about all the enablers that he has. It may look like one man, but he didn't have at least some of the senators and some of the business class. Certainly, we wouldn't know who he was. Then we have 61, which was all about Bernie Sanders and my disappointment, but not surprised that he's behaving exactly as he did in 2016. And that dovetailed nicely with 62, which was about social media, the fake outrage, the fake people, the Russian trolls starting hashtags on Twitter every day, my own personal personal experience getting catfished by a Bernie Sanders fan. So all the episodes kind of build nicely. But if there's one issue that's on everybody's minds, it's almost impossible to be doing a podcast right now and not directly talk about the coronavirus and even beyond the coronavirus, the recession and the economic instability that it's creating. First of all, let's start with the question of has a recession started? Absolutely. A recession has started. And I know Trump doesn't want to believe that. And he thinks if we all go back to work by Easter weekend, everything's going to be hunky dory and we can snap out of this and hey, by 4th of July, the stocks are coming back. There's a raging bull market. And he's looking at very small recessions like maybe the 2000.com burst. And I think that that's dreaming. I think Republicans are completely in denial. I think the business class is in denial. I think the recession has started. There's really brief recessions, and then there's longer ones. 2008 was the worst one we've had since the Great Depression. But before that, the last one was the 2000.com burst, which really was very minuscule, wasn't really even a recession, I wouldn't think. And then in 1992, George H.W. Bush had a recession that historically was over very quickly, but it still allowed Clinton to beat him and become president. Now, first of all, I want to say that I was going to predict a recession this year anyway. So even without the coronavirus, I was predicting a recession as early as last August. I wrote some answers on Quora and things like that. I mean, definitely was thinking there would be a recession in 2020. The reason for that being the last two significant recessions, if you don't count the dot-com burst, which really didn't affect a lot of people, may have affected some stockholders, but majority of people didn't even know that that was going on or really didn't care. The last real recessions that we've had, 2008 and 1992, they were in the last years of an unpopular Republican president. Two startling statistics. Number one, there has not been a Republican president to not have a recession begin in their first term since Teddy Roosevelt. Now, all these people say, well, that's just a quirk of history, and that's not anything that Republicans are doing. I don't see how you can say that. When Gerald Ford, who was in the office for two years, had a recession, all the way up to Eisenhower, who had three recessions begin in his term, all the way to Hoover, who started the Great Depression, all the way to the Bushes, who had recessions, and Reagan, and now Trump. I mean, I really don't see how you cannot see that there's some connective tissue, and that is of course, their policies don't benefit working people. Not since Teddy Roosevelt has the Republican Party really given a shit about working class people. And you might could even make the case that that's not totally true for him. And even beyond Teddy Roosevelt's first term, he eventually did have a recession. In truth, there hasn't been a Republican president to not have a recession in their term since James Garfield. And that's only because he was assassinated about eight or nine months into his term. So his presidency was less than a year. And he's the last one. Panic of 1893 and then the recession of 1881. So you had Chester A. Arthur even had a recession. So I mean, really, and even before Garfield, Ulysses S. Grant had a massive recession. They had to basically take back every deal they'd ever made with the Native Americans to get out of that one. Abraham Lincoln, of course, the Civil War consumed his entire presidency. So you could say James A. Garfield is the only Republican president to not have a recession in their term. And that's because he served for less than a year. Are two startling statistics that Trump would historically be the first since Teddy Roosevelt not to have recession beginning his first term. So that made me feel very, very unlikely. I'm like, hey, 
if competent presidents like Eisenhower can't get out of their first term without a recession, there's no fucking way Trump's going to. Not to mention the fact that we've been in a slow pattern of economic recovery for literally 12 years. All bull markets must end eventually. People say, recessions, you know, those are not guaranteed. That's bullshit. Eventually, every cycle must go bust. If there's a bull market, there's a bear market. If every action has a reaction. Just like for every Bush, there must be a Clinton. And then for another Bush, there must be an Obama. And then for an Obama, there must be a Trump. And then for a Trump, there must be a Biden. I mean, there always has to be these cycles that come through in America. Part of this is a segue into why can't people put the pieces together? Reagan comes in and has a sky-high deficit. Reagan and Bush, and then Clinton has to come in, and he has a recession to deal with, and then he eventually has a budget surplus. Then his budget surplus goes to George W. Bush, who squanders it on tax cuts. Then at the end of the Bush presidency, there's a sky-high deficit and a recession. Then Obama has to come in and fix everything. Then by the end of his presidency, there's a raging bull market. Then Trump comes in, and he squanders that, and now there's going to be a recession. Why can't people put it together? The Republican Party is terrible for the economy. Trump himself has said this by the way. Back in Clinton's time as president when Trump was a soft Democrat or, you know, he's been all over the map politically but he even gave an interview saying the economy does better under Democrats. And a lot of people in the business community, some of them seem to know this and some of them seem to not know it that much. And I think part of it is because we almost get locked into a false dynamic where there's the Elizabeth Warren people and the Bernie Sanders people and the ultra progressives that are like, yeah, we need to make Wall Street public or whatever. They're so anti-business that it drives all these business people into the arms of the Republican Party. And yet at the same time, when you look at it, historically, there's always been a crash and there's always been a bear market eventually. And then a Democrat has to fix it. Over the last few decades, you can certainly make the case that Democrats are by far better for the economy, stretching all the way back from FDR. And yet all the business people, core Republican constituency, they're probably the most Republican constituency. And you have to look at it and think, is the little bit of a percentage that you save in taxes, like, oh, Republicans want you to pay 20% in taxes, liberals want you to pay 30%. Is that little, little, sliver of taxes that you're saving, is that really worth the massive depletion in your net worth every time the market crashes and a Republican president doesn't know what they're doing and everything goes sideways? To look at that and think you're almost not a smart businessman if you can't see that Democrats are better for your pocketbook. And we almost don't like that in this country. Like we almost don't want to think of it that way. We want to think of it as like Republicans, they're the business people and they're the ones who do the economy and liberals are the bleeding hearts at the soup kitchens and they don't know how the economy works. They're bad at it. And the majority of Democrats that's actually not true. They manage things better than Republicans do from virus responses all the way to the economy. They know how to get shit done. They're those capable manager types. The technocrats and the pragmatists, they may not be as flashy and they may not get the hosannas that the AOCs of the party do, but they're definitely there. They're the majority of the party managing it. But there's a real resistance to looking at it that way because it's almost synonymous with what's good for Wall Street and what's good for stockholders. That can't be good for the average American. And I don't really believe that that's true. I think that they actually tie together nicely. People say all the time, well, the majority of Americans, they don't own stocks. Actually, about 52% of Americans own stocks. If you count 401ks and IRAs and public pension funds and things like that that do invest in the stock market, slim majority of Americans do. But even the ones that don't belong to that, they're absolutely tied to the stock market. There's never been a recession without a stock market crash. The stock market is all about expectations. If you look at it and you think, well, Microsoft is the only trillion dollar company left in the world. Apple and Google and Amazon, they all fell beneath a certain mark. Why is Microsoft, it it changes, but between 135 a share to 155 a share as of the last two weeks, it's going in between those two numbers. So why is that at that price? And Amazon's at $1,900 a share. And Google's at between $1,000 a share to $1,500 a share, sometimes a little bit over that. So why do Google and Amazon, companies that on paper are worth a little bit less, Why do they trade for 10 times, sometimes nearly 20 times, of a company like Microsoft. No rhyme or reason to it except that the market is totally based on expectations. It's totally based on what people think something's going to be worth, what's going to drive that up. Now, there's a lot of deals in the stock market right now. Something like Tesla a month ago was trading at $900 a share, $900, $915 a share. Last week, I think it hit like 430 
So you're talking about literally less than half of what it was worth a month ago. Now, does that company actually lose its value? No, probably it was overrated to begin with in terms of was it worth 900 bucks a share? Probably not. And then when it came back down to 430, that was a little bit lower than what it might have actually been worth. Today, I think it's up at about 550. If it falls again, it could be something interesting to look at. They sit on Robinhood, which Robinhood, I think mostly millennials use that. Younger people, they use the Robinhood app because they're like, hey, there's no fees on each individual trade. Well, several of the bigger platforms, they don't have fees either. They like Robinhood. And so they were saying that Tesla was the number one bought stock in the month of February. So if you were buying it at $900 a share, and a lot of millennials were, you lost more than half the money you put into that. So for millennials and younger people scraping up a thousand bucks and saying, oh, I own one share of Tesla. I'm so proud of myself, my first 900 bucks, and it's gone. I'm down to 450 a share. And people say, well, this is all great, but we don't own stocks. We don't care about this. You should care about it because basically what I'm getting at is with the expectations of stock market, that will feed into what happens. There's never been a time when the stock market has completely crashed and crashed for a long time and stayed very low. And that didn't lead companies to start laying people off. Even if you don't personally own stocks, you may work for a corporation that's publicly traded. Working at a Tesla factory, which that's kind of a bad example, but let's say that you're working there, they're at 915 a share, and then they go down to 425 a share. You know, eventually that's going to lead to layoffs. It does kind of make a difference when people say things like, who cares what the stock market is? Let's talk about Main Street, not Wall Street. Unfortunately, and we may not like the way that this is, Main Street kind of works for Wall Street in a roundabout way. If you think about the way that people have to buy stock to flood a company's balance sheet. Another example would be Elon Musk has SpaceX. SpaceX is not publicly traded, but what he wants to do is he wants to spin off Starlink into a publicly traded company. Starlink would be a global constellation of satellites that would basically give people internet service, especially in rural areas and areas that are hard for places like AT&T to service. Now, I'm completely on board with this plan. My parents in rural Alabama, they have charter communications and charter communications fucking sucks. They're one of the worst cable companies in America. They had a monopoly in that part of the Southeast and yet the service was bad. There was all these problems with it. On demand was a disaster. My mom would be like, I want to watch something on demand. They'd have the first episode and the fourth episode and it's like, where's two and three? And they wouldn't post two and three and she'd have to call somebody at charter and a lot of shows that weren't as popular that I actually liked. Usually I'm the guy who's wanting to watch the shows that nobody else in Alabama has heard of and yet they would not put them out. They would yank them. They wouldn't update on demand for them. If there was ever any kind of a disaster or, or even a heavy rain, they'd be like, oh, let's interrupt this show Brody cares about because Alabama people don't watch that show and they'd rather know about heavy rain that could turn into a thunderstorm that could turn into a tornado, but it never really did. So I hate charter communications. They were eventually bought by AT&T. AT&T is now a monopoly, essentially a telecom monopoly. And we hear a lot about Comcast being a monopoly, but if AT&T owns DirecTV, which they do, they bought it, and they own Spectrum, in itself owns Charter, it's a Russian babushka doll. You have all these individual monopolies like Charter Communications that were bought by a bigger monopoly like AT&T, which also bought Time Warner, which owns Warner Brothers and HBO and HBO Go and HBO Max. So they have no incentive to innovate or make things better, or make things easier. Cable prices have gone nothing but up, which makes no sense. There's all these people that are saying we can't afford cable. Cable is way too expensive. So we're cutting the cord and AT&T is like, you know what we'll do? We'll raise the price. And it's like, wait a minute, that's the exact opposite. They're just raising the price on people like me who really like cable and actually would prefer that to having 10 individual streaming services. If you're paying for Hulu and Netflix and Amazon Prime and HBO Go and Showtime Anytime and Stars Play and Disney Plus and Apple TV, and I'm sure there's five I'm forgetting, 12 to 15 streaming services, major ones, way more than cable costs. So, I mean, I kind of like the old model where you had bundling and all these different channels together and it was a reasonable price. But now because of the cord cutters going to different services or whatever, you basically have AT&T deciding like, you know what, we could drop our cable prices and have new customers come in and be like, this is way cheaper than all these different streaming services. But I think we'd prefer to just jack up the price on the customers who were left and make a shittier product and a crappier cable box that tears up every couple of months. You know, even if you're paying for DVR, you got to go in and exchange the box. You lose all your DVR recordings. You say, why can't you load the DVR stuff that's on the one box to a different box? Yeah, well, I don't know. We don't care. That would be an innovation and they're not interested in that. They're interested in buying more and more and more companies and consolidating more and more and more power. And even when they own DirecTV and are talking about now trying to squeeze DirecTV and gradually shut that down or whatever, you have to look at it and think Starlink would be very, very welcome 
of service is what I'm getting at. Especially if you live in the rural southeast and your broadband internet sucks. You barely have dial-up speeds at my parents' house that they can pull up. Maybe one Yahoo article every 15 minutes. The wheels of industry move pretty slow out there. So this would be way better. Because he's trying to spin off Starlink from SpaceX. He wants to do that to make it publicly traded because that'll be billions of dollars in revenue and billions of dollars that can then be flooded into SpaceX for some of the more complicated stuff that they're doing. If your company's private, you're basically relying on private business anyway. A bank still has to underwrite your company's loans. They still have to agree to finance your company's project and your credit. So if Wall Street crashes, if you work for a private company, it's going to be very, very hard for you to get financing for any of your projects. If you have a big construction project, good luck borrowing money for that. Money starts flowing into the system and that leads to a contraction and that leads to layoffs. If it's a public company, it's directly tied to the stock price and that'll lead to layoffs. Stock, if it's at 40 bucks a share tomorrow and goes to two bucks a share two weeks from now, there's no way you're not going to have layoffs. I do think for a lot of Democrats and liberals to constantly shit on the stock market and Wall Street, and I'm not a trader, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not like a financial guy, really, necessarily. I'm not Scaramucci being like, yo, giving you some pump and dump scheme. I'm just saying that the disdain some people have for publicly traded stocks, it's a little bit like Ron Paul nuts and their idea of the gold standard and get rid of the Federal Reserve. I mean, it doesn't quite reflect the economic reality for a lot of people. So the question becomes, is there going to be a recession? Yes, there will be. Not only because Trump is in the White House and I have no faith in him, even if you have faith in Trump, even if you are a Trump voter, which if you are, you're probably not listening to this podcast, but even if you are, even if you say, well, historically, you know, all that stuff about Republican presidents having recession, that's all bunk because Trump is a businessman. He's a business whiz. Everything's going to go well. Forgetting the fact that he bankrupted on casinos, which I didn't even know was possible. I mean, I really had no idea you could even do that. The whole business model, give me 20 bucks, I'll give you back a dollar. And somehow you go bankrupt doing that. I mean, that's like hearing that a lemonade stand is using arsenic in their lemonade. Oh, I can't believe we got sued for $100 million and we actually lost money on a lemonade stand. Even if you don't believe any of that shit. The problem is the coronavirus. And you'll say, well, the coronavirus, that'll be over with by Easter or Memorial Day at the latest, and then the market will go back to normal. All of these huge American companies are loaded with debt. And I hear the memes on Twitter all the time being like, well, how come individuals are expected to have $10,000 in savings and a company like Delta Airlines, their balance sheet can be loaded with debt and they can't support their balance sheet for six weeks. People care about Delta Airlines because they employ 10,000 people. They don't care about you because you're a mouth to feed. And in the government size, it's like you're almost taking money from them. That's why you see the Republicans be like, we're going to give bailouts to all these big companies because that's jobs. Or the airline industry, they have to stay open. We can't let the airline industry fold. You know, I don't know. Maybe some of the really, really far left and the really, really far right would be like, hey, we'll all let the airlines crash and we'll just go back to riding around in trains. It'll take us five days to get from L.A. to New York. But that's not possible. They can't let that happen. You as an individual... They can let you starve to death. If you starve to death, if you're on government assistance, theoretically in their minds, that's less money going into a balance sheet. That's less debt for them to pay. Is that tough? Is that cruel? Is that heartless? Yeah. But nobody ever said the world wasn't a cruel place. Another example of that would be you see in the UK where Boris Johnson was okay letting the coronavirus spread. He wanted to spread as far and as wide as it possibly could. Now in his mind, he was out there saying like, oh, well, if we let the coronavirus spread, then that'll make us more immune to future versions of the disease. There's no evidence that you can't be reinfected with the coronavirus. That's absolute bullshit when he said that really probably he was thinking hey our healthcare system is very expensive this virus mostly targets old people if it kills three percent of the population and it's mostly the sick and the old maybe that's less money that's required for the national health service extremely cruel and callous way to look at it but i bet that's the way he did look at it now of course he's got the coronavirus because karma's a bitch but at the same time just from a pure numbers perspective you could see what i'm saying With Delta Airlines and all these big companies, they say, well, what about those Trump tax cuts that should have went to them? In 2017 and 2018, you know, they were supposed to be hoarding all this money from the Trump tax cuts. They didn't do that. Instead, they went and did stock buybacks. They bought back the stocks to artificially juice the prices. So Trump going out there and bragging about the Trump economy's booming and everybody's saying, well, he's just talking about the stock market and the unemployment numbers. The unemployment numbers are misleading because he's not measuring underemployment. It's like if you drive a car for Uber, technically you're employed. Technically you have a job. Technically Alabama Liberal has a job because he's got Alabama Liberal. But underemployed is in you don't have the money to pay your bills. You spend more money than you actually take in. Those numbers 
numbers would be very different than the unemployment numbers. And the stock market was artificially juiced from the tax cut. Number one, it went up when he first took office because he was promising the tax cut. Again, the expectations were, oh, this is going to lead to a raging bull market with all this new money. So that, first of all, pumped up the stocks more than they would have been because of the expectation of the tax cut. Then the tax cut passes and a lot of corporations think, hey, it's a good idea to buy back our shares and we'll just own more and more shares. And then that artificially juiced the price because it looks like, hey, a million dollars of Apple stock is moving today. Not thinking like, hey, it's Apple buying it. And they also were able to give away more and more dividends. The dividend payments went up for several big companies. So if you know that one single share, it was paying back a dollar a year. Now it's going to go to five bucks a year. Well, that sounds like even better. So even more people are buying shares. So it was dividends. It was stock buybacks. It was all smoke and mirrors. Then you also saw it be extremely concentrated in the, into certain sectors because retail already wasn't doing so high even before the coronavirus. So a lot of the stock market was going into tech and pharmaceutical drugs. They were doing way better than the average company was. The average company, they really were not moving like even before this. So you had several big companies just staying pretty flat, pretty stagnant, and then a rage in tech and pharmaceutical sector. Then, of course, when this happens, the pharmaceutical sector stayed about the same because it's coronavirus. And if you even rumor, hey, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, they're developing a cure for coronavirus. Oh my God. Regeneron is now actually up from what they were before because people are rumoring that they have a cure for the coronavirus. If you had even a rumor that a coronavirus vaccine had passed a clinical trial and had saved even one life, that stock would explode. So pharmaceutical industry and the healthcare industry, those stocks have stayed about the same. Big tech has been hammered. That'll go back to normal pretty soon, especially if it's software-based. Something software-based, it almost doesn't make sense that it got hammered in the first place. Facebook stock got hammered, but does that really make sense when people are confined to their house? It's a software company. They're going to be using Instagram and Facebook and things like that even more than they would be. The Trump economy, it was all smoke and mirrors. It was all an illusion. It was all a con. And now that you've had the first sign of real crisis, all those gains are gone. But so is several trillion dollars in tax revenue that was never collected. So it was actually worse than if he'd done nothing. Like if he'd done absolutely nothing since he's been in office, at least you'd have several trillion more dollars in tax revenue not given away in a huge tax cut. And then that could be going more directly to people in these stimulus payments. Really, we were worse off in the Trump economy than if he just sat there and done nothing. I think the Trump economy was smoke and mirrors. It's disappeared. The question of why corporate bankruptcy is more important than individual bankruptcy is the question of why do these big companies, like why are their balance sheets so, so bad? Why are they so loaded with debt? Debt is tax deductible. So you can write debt off on your tax returns. And if you ever go into the black or you have a huge profit, that's what's paying the taxes. So that's why a lot of companies use accounting tricks and sometimes deliberately load up with debt. They almost don't seem interested in clearing debt off their balance sheets because they almost like that to get that tax advantage. Again, you might think this is penny wise and pound foolish. Is it really that big a deal to pay the 30% income tax on some huge cash surplus for your company? Or is it worse to have this mound of debt and you have to ask the government for a bailout? Well, since most companies know the government will bail them out if they're essential to the economy, I believe Delta Airlines is essential to the economy. Some of the big banks are essential to the economy because they know the government will come in and they will do something for them them, it almost doesn't incentivize them to be fiscally responsible. And you might think, well, after this is over, we need to reevaluate that. And I remember I watched this show, Trust, which was an FX TV show. It was about the Getty family. It was about when John Paul Getty's grandson was kidnapped in Italy. Some people say he faked it. Some people say that he began as a fake, but it became real. But it's all about that situation. And at the time the show came out, it flopped because there had just been a movie about this. Remember Kevin Spacey was going to play the Getty character? and then he got replaced by Christopher Plummer and it also had Mark Wahlberg and Michelle Williams. So because the movie had just come out and already not done that hot, people really weren't like, hey, you know what we need? Instead of a two-hour movie, why don't we watch the same story, exact same story in a 13-hour <laughs> miniseries? But first episode, I believe, there was a scene where Getty was explaining how even though he was the richest man in America, on paper, he was so poor he could get milk tokens from the government, which I guess that'd be the equivalent of WIC today. Basically, it was him made a shitload of profits, but he sunk those immediately into the old company. The old company sunk those immediately into buying more rigs and old producing equipment. The rigs and old producing equipment sunk that into hotels. The hotels paid the money back into the trust. 
and the whole cycle went over. So all that money went into trust funds instead of his personal wealth. And that's why on paper, he barely paid any taxes. He, he not only didn't pay taxes, he probably got money back from the government, even though at the time he was the equivalent of Jeff Bezos, just about. Amazon, they say, how did Amazon not pay taxes for 15 years? And the reason is because they weren't profitable until 2017 or 2018. They lost money every year. They were a publicly traded company for almost 20 years. You can look at these accounting tricks, and that's why so many major companies, they're almost insolvent whenever they have a real crisis. And now we're having a case where you're going to have two months of market contraction, basically meaning spending is not happening. People are stuck at home. They don't want to buy anything. Also, they're afraid, which fear kills more good markets than reality. So they're afraid that there's going to be layoffs. And probably if you're smart remotely, you're hoarding right now. Just because you're sitting at home and you're bored to death, that doesn't mean you should go on Amazon and fulfill your shopping list and buy everything you've ever wanted to buy. Like you really should be saving your money. People have been locked at home in quarantines. Some of them since February, the majority of the country in March and probably April. We don't know when it'll open back up. But either way, what you're going to see is Trump spending several trillion dollars, as he's already done, and the Congress has done, to corporations, and then the stocks go up temporarily for a little while. And then the reality of it being like, oh, wait a minute. A lot of the companies that are hardest hit by this, Carnival Cruises, Delta Airlines, hotels, luxury goods, retail, some banking sectors, even something you think might be okay in something like this, like Discover Card. Discover Card has a side business where they loan out student loans loans and home mortgage payments, if you start having a wave of people not paying it or people skipping it out or they can't pay it or housing bankruptcies or defaults on different loans, that's going to hurt their business a lot. So even some of the credit card companies and banks may not be as solvent as you think they would be. So you're going to start seeing all these different companies begging the government for money. Then even once people go back to work, really the biggest piece of the economy. I barely brought that up. I should spend more time with this. But basically, if something like 40% of the United States has less than $1,000 in savings, and then a huge chunk of the country is not on salary, meaning they're basically day workers and day laborers, and that if you can't physically show up to work at a construction site or a waitressing job or a bartender gig or a movie theater or retail or all these different jobs, you have to physically be there and clock in to get paid. And if you don't work, you don't get paid. Every job I've just had just about has been like that, where it's like at Walmart or the grocery store or the movie theater. If you don't physically, and those are all my jobs, by the way, every job I just named just about to what I've worked in, you have to physically show up, clock in, and if you don't get paid. If you take a week off, that's just a week you don't get paid. So a lot of people barely have any savings or severely have debt, credit card debt, student loan debt, housing debt, medical debt, all these different debts. They just really can't afford to miss any work. And then you have a case where they literally can't work and millions and millions of people four to 10 weeks, possibly longer than that. So you're going to have a wave of individual bankruptcies along with the corporate bankruptcies that are all being filed. So you'll have corporate bailouts, individual bailouts. Some people know bailouts. They'll just become homeless. They'll lose everything. Probably a lot worse than 2008 because you got to think those bad mortgage bundlings and those housing bundlings, that affected a lot of people, but probably not as bad as if 40% of the American economy literally cannot pay their bills from week to week for several months on end. Even when they go back to work, what's the one thing they're not going to want to spend money on? All of the most affected industries. You're not going to bars. You're not going to movies. You're not going on cruises. You're not doing air travel. You're not doing travel, period. You're not going to hotels. There's no day spas. There's no massage parlors. There's no bowling trips. You don't want to go to Nordstrom's when this is happening, right? On and on and on it goes. And even on top of that, you have the fear component of just because Trump says it's safe to go back to work at the end of April. You're going to have a lot of people that are afraid. My son, I wanted to have a birthday party for him in April, but now it's almost like, well, who would come? All these kids are so afraid of contagions and being infected by coronavirus. You know, he's not a king. He can't just say, the economy, I declare it open again, right? Open sesame. You'll still have a case where a lot of people are afraid to go anywhere. And even if they're forced to go to work or forced to go to school, those are not things where they're spending money. So a lot of stuff that looks extraneous, like going to see the new Wonder Woman 2 movie, they may not feel like going to a movie theater and being around a bunch of strangers. They may not feel like taking an Uber and being in the same car with a bunch of strangers. They won't feel like being on an airplane or a carnival cruise or a hotel and being around a bunch of strangers. Once you know that, you know that a lot of companies are going to be hurting. And even if the stock market bounced up, you're looking at several quarters of contraction. The money's not going into the economy. A lot of people are afraid. They don't have money to spend. Even the ones that have money to spend, they don't want to spend it. Corporate bankruptcies, individual bankruptcies, people not spending money, layoffs. And then you have companies that are not in good fiscal health to begin with. Sears and JCPenney, I don't see how they beat the Reaper as long as they have. But even before this was happening, they were penny stocks. 
Sears stock has been less than a dollar for several months. And people say things again like, why are you so obsessed with the stock price? You sound like a JP Morgan. You kind of do need to learn this stuff. I don't want to encourage people and say, well, the stock market's rigged. It's all a game. Don't worry about it. Warren Buffett once said, if you can't make money while you sleep, you will work till the day you die. And I do believe that. I don't want to encourage liberals to be economically ignorant. Like I want you to really think before you go out and buy a horrible student loan or a bad mortgage or invest in a company that sucks. I do. I mean, people are sitting there thinking like, Alabama liberal, you're over there talking about investing money. What the fuck? We don't have any money. I mean, what planet are you living on? We're going to be able to barely make ends meet. You just said it. For several weeks, people are going to barely be able to make ends meet. And I'm aware of that. One of my favorite sketches of the Kirsten Wig uh, Saturday Night Live period, and she was not very good at impressions, but she could do a killer Susie Orman impression. Josh Brolin was the host, and he came on, and it was kind of when the recession was going on, I think, and he played a guy who lost everything, and he was sitting there thinking like, yeah, I'm sleeping on a pile of old diapers, so that way I can have a bed and some pizza boxes or my pillow and everything. And she's like, okay, I hate to tell you, Josh, but I think you may have to tap into your 401k account and use some of your liquid fund and your emergency savings. And he's like, Susie, I don't think you're hearing me. I'm wrestling some raccoons for dinner over a trash can. You don't want to be that guy who's basically telling people like, hey, you know, you may have to tap into your 401k. And they're like, I don't have one. I don't have an emergency savings. I don't have any money to invest. But if you do, and you have a few thousand dollars, here's what I want to encourage people to do. Stay away from terrible companies that are going to be out of business anyway. If you see a penny stock, there's a reason that that company is a penny stock. There's a reason Sears and JCPenney were down so low to begin with. That's not a sign of investor confidence. So even if you don't care about the stock market, you need to know why stocks are trading at what prices they are. Because if you work at JCPenney and you think, well, the stock market it doesn't affect me. Your stock is less than a dollar. Your company could be out of business literally six months and then you're fucked. And that does matter and that does affect you. So I don't want to tell people to just ignore the stock market. So you have several companies. They say, what companies do you think would be most likely to be out of business? I'm surprised Sears and JCPenney have lasted as long as they have. But I know that they're heavily in debt and they need banks to finance that debt and banks to write them loans. And when you look at the stock price of their companies, they're so low, no bank would want to take that risk. And if there's a recession, cash dries up in the markets. There's no cash to invest in things. There's no cash for risky bets. They don't want to invest in things that they don't think will get paid back. They're going to be very, very conservative. This is why 2008 was so bad. The banks were so affected from the bad mortgages, they quit loaning money out to people. So even people that had a good plan, like I make $25,000 a year, I found a house for hundred grand. I can pay all the money back within 12 years and I'm going to live there. My family's going to live there. That was a solid bet. They wouldn't bankroll somebody like that because their credit wasn't that great or they didn't make enough money. Money. All of that matters when we're looking at the economy and what to do. I think Sears and JCPenney and possibly Pier 1 will be out of business. That'll be thousands of more people laid off, thousands more unemployed, unemployment benefits. They say a record number of people have already applied for unemployment benefits. It looks better for Joe Biden every day because a lot of the unemployed people applying for benefits are in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Ohio. These are battleground states. If he flips those three, he's president. To say nothing of Arizona and Florida, where I already feel his chances are pretty good, possibly even North Carolina. We're looking at it and thinking, I think those companies are out of business. General Electric has been struggling for years and years and years. The guy who exposed Bernie Madoff and said Bernie Madoff is a Ponzi scheme and the SEC wouldn't take me seriously. And it took me 10 minutes to look at Bernie Madoff's books and say, this is a Ponzi scheme. You don't have a hedge fund that goes up and up and up and up in a straight line. And he, you know, like clockwork, they report 8% growth every single quarter. You don't have that unless it's a Ponzi scheme. They wouldn't take him seriously and they wouldn't listen to him. Today, he's talking about General Electric and that basically, they will be the next Enron. I would listen to him. Doesn't mean it'll happen, but if it does happen, then that'll be thousands of dollars you lost if you invest in their stock. Coal companies. Coal industry has already been hammered. The Republicans, they're kind of in bed with the oil companies like ExxonMobil. 80 to 90% of ExxonMobil's campaign contributions go to Republicans. So you have Republicans very in bed with oil, conservative Democrats in bed with fracking and natural gas, most Democrats in renewable energy and stuff like that. There's no place for coal. Trump is the last big coal supporter there is. They know the industry's dying. Right now you have seven major coal companies. Peabody Energy, Arc Energy, Murray Energy. And I don't think Murray Energy is publicly traded, but a lot of them are. And you think, how can the market sustain this many mega American coal companies when the need for coal is at zero? Oil prices have crashed and most people like alternative energy better anyway. So I don't think a lot of coal companies are definitely where you want to put your money. Then you might even have something that would be a little bit more sensible like Ford Motors. Ford Motors 
Motors has been struggling for years. Okay, and I love Ford Motors. I mean, I have a lot of nostalgia for that brand. I mean, I think of Ford Motors, I think of American Pie and milkshakes and diners, and I have a lot of nostalgia for them. But Ford Motors is completely disconnected from what American consumers actually want. For years, it's been like, okay, we want smaller, we want hybrids, we want electric cars, we want sustainable cars, cars you can drive for 500 miles and don't have to take to a mechanic. Ford Motors like, we got you loud and clear. Here's our new Megasaurus T-Rex uh, SUV Hummer Mobile that's basically a double-decker bus stacked on top of an SUV's frame, and you can fit 25 people in there, and they're all spacious and room. There's a hot tub in the back. Their cars have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. They've completely ignored what people are looking for. They think everybody wants this big damn gas guzzler, and maybe if you're a rich private school parent, like the ones we were dealing with in episode 53, that's what you drive, where you go up there and you see this wall of Range Rovers that get two fucking miles to the gallon. There's cars like that are a big pain in the ass, unless you're some rich prick or you're a suburban liver or something like that. Like in a busy like LA, you go to a parking garage, half the spaces are compact spaces. You can't even fit in one of those spaces. You got to be the jerk who takes up two parking spaces and everybody hates you. I mean, sometimes it's like you just want to key people like that when there's parkings full and some asshole takes up three spaces in their giant car. And they've ignored what people are looking for. They don't want things that get bad gas mileage. They don't want bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, we're going to a space where a lot of millennials don't even own a car. They use Uber everywhere. They use those Lime scooters or public transit, things like that. So for Ford Motors to ignore what people wanted, and how do I know that they did? They let the Ford Taurus die. The Ford Taurus was an extremely popular sedan. It was the closest thing they had to a Toyota Camry. They let it die. Then they had the Ford Focus and the Ford Fiesta, and they've let those kind of fall by the wayside. They said that Ford is getting ready to replace the Ford Fiesta and the Ford Focus, and they showed the car it was. It was another one of these like hybrid Jeep truck monstrosities. And I thought, how clueless can you be? Not everybody wants to be the asshole driving a tank down the LA freeway. There's a lot of people who don't want those kind of cars. So because they've become almost completely disconnected with the American consumer, and especially the international consumer, you don't see Ford cars in Europe. I mean, other than some of the sportier models or maybe a Mustang every once in a while, you don't see these gigantic-ass cars. European, that means small. Like in our apartment, they say, you have a European-style washer and dryer. That means small. We can fit four pairs of socks and an underwear in there, and that's about it. You got to do three three loads of clothes a day to catch up with the laundry. But European means compact, means small. You see these movies like The Born Identity, where he drives a Mini Cooper up and down the streets. In Asia, the same thing. People want smaller cars. They want motorcycles, they want bikes, they want to be able to really speed around the city and things like that, especially some of the mega cities. In Africa, you just simply don't see that many Fords. You see some Chevys, mostly Toyotas. You see Toyotas everywhere. It's almost looking like Toyota is going to be what Ford Motors should have done and was about 20 or 30 years ago. And then Tesla is going to be the cutting edge. Tesla will almost be the new luxury cars and sports cars. So I hope I'm wrong. I really do because I have a lot of nostalgia for the Ford brand. But even before the crisis, I thought like, hey, how come Ford Motors is at $9 a share? And at the time, they were the biggest car company in America. And Tesla Motors is at $300 a share. That almost doesn't make sense. And then, of course, they went down from $9 a share. Today, they're at like 5 bucks a share or something. And then Tesla at one point, like I said was $900 a share. The only real time, and I want to use this as an example of what I'm talking about, majority of the stocks that I've invested in, large majority, have made money. And that's not because I'm an investment whiz. That's not because I'm a banker or I run a Edward Jones in my spare time or something like that. I'm saying that it sounds like I'm bragging. I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying that I do a little bit know what I'm talking about. The large majority of stocks I've invested in have made money. And there was one time that one didn't. Outright, total, complete flop. And I'll share that story with you just so you can know what not to do. Because I saw a lot of people being like, hey, should we pull our money out of the markets? That would be a bad idea. You're going to lose your money. Warren Buffett, some people think he's the world's greatest investor of all time. He's lost money. A few months, he's lost something like $70 billion. Not him specifically, but his company, Berkshire Hathaway, because they had shares in Apple and Amex and Bank of America, JP Morgan, Coca-Cola, Delta Airlines, and all those have gone down. But he's not pulling his money out. He's not saying like, oh my God, it's gone down. Let me just lose the $70 billion. In fact, probably he'll buy more stocks during this crisis. And if you pull your money out now, when a company you believe in, like if you have a good, solid company, and it depends on what it is, because honestly, you know, some companies are worth more than others. But if you own shares in Apple and you're like, oh my God, it was at 300 bucks. Now it's at 200 bucks. I better pull all my money out. You're going to lose your money. So don't do that. But the one time that I got fucked in the stock market, it had nothing to do with the coronavirus 
or before that, the 2008 recession, or Bernie Sanders, or Donald Trump, or instability in the political sphere. It had nothing to do with any of that stuff. It was just a bad company, and it was a bad company in a bull market. And this company called Aurora Cannabis, and if any of you have ever heard of that, you're already saying, oh, Alabama liberal, how could you do it? Basically, it was right before Canada was going to legalize marijuana for the whole country. And they were a Canadian pot company. There were several of them, really too many of them, and I didn't think about that at the time. But I looked at Aurora Cannabis, and I'm like, hey, you know, 10 bucks a share before the big weed vote. And at the same time, Tilray, which was a competitor, they were at like $300 a share. So I'm like, similar to Ford and Tesla being like, well, how can two companies that do the same thing and one of them's technically bigger and got a bigger market share, how can it not be worth more in the long run? It wasn't like a ton of money, but Aurora Cannabis, it went from 10 bucks a share. Uh, last week, I think it was at less than a dollar. At one point, it was a penny stock. So you might be thinking like, ooh, ouch, that sting of losing $1,000 in the market, something like that. Like that that sting really sucks and we can't afford to do that and it does once that happens to you once you don't ever want to feel that again but that was a company that it was a bad company it wasn't necessarily external factors that ruined it or wrecked it it was bad management it was a bad business model their whole thing was they wanted to buy all this weed and stockpile all this weed and really they had a huge supply and demand problem and Canada's government they slowly slowly rolled out the legalization like Canada should have a thousand legal weed dispensaries. Instead, there's less than 100 because they're so slowly granting new licenses for these places. And I wasn't thinking about, this is a brand new market. It's not regulated. It's a new frontier. There's that old phrase, pioneers get slaughtered and settlers prosper. First company to go out and do something, they might burn through a shitload of money. That's why some people like SpaceX because they're learning from all these other private aerospace companies that have all gone bankrupt. The private aerospace sector is, is a graveyard. I mean, it's full of shitty companies, especially private satellite installations and things like that. Take those advice and then you can be a settler and you can prosper. Like after all the pioneers got killed, then you could come in and and learn from their mistakes. But I had FOMO. I had fear of missing out and everybody was like, hey, the Canadian pot sector, it could be a $1 trillion business in five years. Not really keeping in mind that Canada, it just doesn't work that way. Canadians are just dragged their feet on a lot of shit. You don't necessarily go to Canada for a windfall, but it was fear of missing out. And so because I didn't want to miss out and I invested money thinking at the time, hey, I've never had a single stock loss and that was before that trade and that's been after that trade all that's been true i had shares in delta airlines they made a little bit of a profit i sold that right before they tanked right before coronavirus other times blx which was a bank in latin america in brazil that handled import export that was right before the olympics and i knew that once everybody went down to the olympics they'd be making all these deals for commodities and that would go through blx so i had that that doubled then i sold it and luckily i did because brazil's a mess they've got all these corruption scandals facebook I bought that early on and then that went up about seven times from what I paid it for it. There's a lot of different investments I've made that have really worked out. I've made more money than I've lost for sure. But that one time where I lost money, ooh, I can still taste it. Like it still tastes bitter. And share that story with people, not necessarily to be like, I don't know what I'm talking about. Ultimately, bull markets, bear markets, all that shit. It's not going to matter for a company that really works, that has good leadership and a good business model. And I also think people should really understand what they're investing in. Because I had a lot of friends that were really, really happy heavy into Bitcoin and they keep trying to get me heavy into Bitcoin. Everybody was like, hey, you got to buy Bitcoin, you got to buy Bitcoin and and didn't really understand it. And they lost a lot of money in it eventually because some of the exchanges that they were trading into, like on paper, I'm worth a million dollars. And then two days later, the exchange folded and they lost all that money that they would have had. I think their initial, I had $10,000 two weeks ago. Today, I've got a million dollars and then the exchange folds before they can get their money out. If there's something that you don't really understand, you kind of don't understand how they make money, something like MoviePass. I mentioned that before where you pay $10 a month and you can get a single movie ticket every single day. I was paying $10 a month. To them, it cost them like $300 to have me on their movie pass because I was going to the movie so much and it's 15 to $20 a ticket in Los Angeles. So that's one of those things where it would be really a poor idea to invest in their parent company, which was a hedge fund that owned them because it's almost like, how do they make money? And their business model makes no sense. With Bitcoin, it's like you don't understand it enough. And with Aurora Cannabis, that was a sector that I didn't understand. I don't know a lot about marijuana. I don't farm it. I don't grow it. I don't smoke it. I don't use it. I don't really buy it. And it was in Canada. It was a market that I didn't understand. They can't even sell it in the United States. States, a country that I live in and understand quite well what consumers want and what they don't want. All of that hype was predicated on once it's legal, all these new customers will come out and they'll buy it when it's legal, when it was kind of like that didn't happen. And also it'll become legal in America.
America and Aurora Cannabis, they'll get licenses to sell in America. And that didn't happen because America's got its own pot companies like MedMen and some others. And also the Canadian government wouldn't drag their ass on creating new dispensaries for them to sell their products. And that wildly didn't happen. And then them going around and buying up all these smaller pot companies loaded their balance sheet with debt. And they also had a supply that they couldn't necessarily move. And there was created a perfect storm of bad management, bad decisions, bad business models, unpredictable business models, and a new frontier that I didn't understand. If you can get past that to good, solid, decent companies in sectors that are not going to be hurt by this, what would I not invest in? Shit you don't understand, like Aurora Cannabis and how they make money, or MoviePass and how they make money, or Bitcoin and how they make money, uh, or sectors that you have no familiarity with. Me and pharmaceutical drugs, I've missed out on a lot of great pharmaceutical stocks because I don't have a medical background and I don't know enough about it. And a lot of pharmaceutical companies, they're loaded with debt on the promise that the drug they're working on will work, which you have no idea if it'll work. It has to pass clinical trials for it to work. Then it'll get approved by the FDA. Then it'll be sold. Then people will buy it. Then people will want it. And then your patent won't it expire. A big pharmaceutical company like Johnson & Johnson, a lot of their original patents are about to expire, meaning they'll have more competition. So that's a huge risk factor. Another stock I didn't invest in, and I'm glad that I didn't, was Beyond Meat because that was trading really, really high for a long time. And I would have bought it at a high price and it's since collapsed. But with all the Beyond Meat and Impossible Burgers and the meat fake substitutes, I understand why companies are going to that because a chicken breast might cost them a dollar and they sell it for four bucks. A chicken breast with one of these companies, it might cost them four cents and they sell it for four bucks. But you almost look at that and think, what's in these things? Is it sawdust and asbestos and cancerous chemicals or whatever? So because you don't really know what's in the so-called proprietary meat blends, what do they put in it to make it taste like meat? Is it worse for you than the meat was initially? Could there be a huge public health scandal? Could there be a big blowback that tanks the stock completely? Because it's not transparent, but I don't necessarily like companies like that. I like companies that are very transparent and they have a clear business model, you understand them. So stay away from stuff like Beyond Meat and new pharmaceutical companies that are totally dependent on their pipeline working out, if they can develop a drug, if they can sell it. All that shit I stay away from. Then I stay away from sectors I don't believe in, like retail, like the Pier Ones and like the JCPenney like the AMC Theaters, all these companies that are about to get hammered. AMC Theaters is publicly traded and they may get a bailout, but at the end of the day, number one, they're owned by a Chinese conglomerate. That doesn't make for a great stability because America, you know, we could be having more and more disputes with China in the long run. So having an American company that's on the American Stock Exchange, but be owned by a Chinese conglomerate, that's not a great idea. Then number two, all these big movies, they're releasing all these things on demand and everything. If they have as much business through that, you may see fewer and fewer people go to a movie theater. Why is it 20 bucks for a movie ticket at AMC theaters when we can literally get this stuff for free or for a dollar or for almost no cost? Again, you got to look at trends in terms of what you believe in. Temporarily, I also stay away from stuff like Carnival Cruises, airlines, and anything that forces strangers to be in the same place. Anything that has a lot of people and they're all in a confined space and they're strangers. And Carnival Cruise Lines is real frustrating for me because they're constantly begging for money and begging for business. They've sent me all these individual mailers and stuff and I'll call them and be like, all right, I'm sure they got some good discounts right now. They don't. They're not offering a discount on shit. There's no good deals to be had with that company. And you'll call them and they'll be like, Brody, we want you on a cruise. We will suck your dick to get you on this boat. We will do anything to get you to book a cruise today. And you'll be like, okay, can my one-year-old daughter who you charge money for because you charge money for every single body in a room regardless of their age can my one-year-old daughter sell for free on your boat we'd rather sink the boat like we'll do anything i'm like how about an actual discount no we're not interested in that so you almost wonder like would they rather the company go under and go bankrupt than let a one-year-old sell for free or and then they'll say things like our deals are half off of your deposit I'm like, that's not a fucking deal. Like, the price is still the price. If the price is $2,000, I'm still going to pay $2,000. But it's just that the deposit goes from 200 bucks to 100 bucks or something. Like, I still have to pay the same amount of money. So that's not really a deal at all. And in fact, if you can't afford all of the deposit to begin with, then you don't have the money for the cruise generally. And I guess they're just hoping people book all these rooms and have all these deposits. And then they default on that and they can get money off the deposits and technically book the same room twice with a little bit of extra money. If you see a house you like and you can't afford the down payment, 
then you're not going to be able to afford the house. And the same thing for all these different companies saying like, hey, we'll charge you slightly different interest or we'll lower the deposits or whatever. Like if you can't afford it right off the bat, don't buy it. So then the question becomes, we know what companies you don't believe in. And I would also include Amazon and Walmart and Costco and Target in that. And that's not because I don't believe in them. That's not because they're bad stocks to own. If you already own shares in those companies, you will make money. And Jim Cramer, um, you know, he's usually wrong, but he says like, what if there's only four retailers in America after this crisis? What if there's only Amazon and Walmart and Costco and Target? And that won't be true. Of course, there'll be more than that. But I understand what he's saying, where those will be the four that make money by far. But at the same time, I'm not crazy about those because they're not on discount right now. As a matter of fact, Walmart is the highest that it's ever been. Amazon is close to their near highs. Costco's made money in this. So a lot of these big retailers, they haven't shown any decrease in their stock prices. So you're not buying them at a discount. You're really buying them at an all-time high. And they probably will go up from here. But I think you can find some better deals than that. Then you have companies like Activision Blizzard or Zoom or things like that where they're already trading very well. The video games and everything that people will be playing at home with Activision Blizzard, some of the video game companies, they haven't dipped at all in their stock price. So you're not going to be buying them at a discount. Same thing with Zoom. So then you look at like, okay, what companies have dipped a lot and you got a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks and you want to put it in something that's dipped a lot and you want that to grow and you think it will rebound. I think you can't go wrong with Microsoft. A lot of stuff that they actually do, software, business software, Microsoft Teams, video chat, this is stuff people are going to be dependent on while this crisis is happening. And even after it's not, they may think like, hey, why don't we have more people telecommute and we can get smaller office space and that'll save us a ton of money. I think whereas Zoom and Slack and some of those stocks have gone up in the market, Microsoft's getting pounded. It was $200 a share almost six weeks ago. Today, it was at 145 a couple days ago it was at 135 so it has seen a huge drop but if you look at what they actually do business software and cloud computing and things like that it's like that's going to become more necessary not less even with the recession because a lot of their products and they're almost not consumer driven they're more driven towards businesses you will need those even more and they're kind of recession proof so i believe in that one the most apple I think is at a discount. Qualcomm, which sells computer chips, I think is at a discount. Visa, at one point it was 160, and then today it might have dropped to 140. When it was at 130, that was attractive. Because out of all the credit card companies, Amex and Discover, they could be hurting a lot because they also loan money out. Visa is just like PayPal. It's just a third-party provider. They don't really do loans and things like that, so you're still going to need them. People may use credit cards and online payment systems even more if they're not buying stuff in a physical store. So there are some good deals out there. There are some quality stocks that I would recommend. But in general, I hope this episode serves more as a warning of what not to do and the fact that we are in a recession. So you should save your money. And if you have any that you're interested in investing, I think you should look at what I'm basically saying not to do. And don't buy bad companies just because they're cheap. If you don't believe in them long term, like ExxonMobil or some of the others that, yeah, they're cheap, but that's because their business model just almost doesn't make sense considering where the future's headed and everything going to. And by all means, if something like Tesla hits 250 or 300 bucks a share again, and it may never again, please help yourself. Okay, everybody. Thanks for listening. I hope you learned a lot. I know it was fun. It's been a great week of podcast. We've had a lot of good episodes and thanks for listening, everybody.